Hi, Florian. Uh, nice to see you again. We spoke a couple of weeks ago. Thank you so much uh, for joining us on uh, Focus Wire Pulse today. We really appreciate your time. We, I think you're there in your scrub, so you're probably in the middle of uh, something there at Mount Sinai. Um, we've always been very keen at Focus Wire to bring in voices, as we call them, from the outside of the industry. And I think the example of uh, having you talk to us today is the best example that we can think of because you know you're at the uh, the center of so many things that are going on around vaccinations and antibody testing and we're going to get into that in a moment but uh, i spoke to your colleague uh, dr eric liam in uh, december for our new reality with series and we touched on uh, a number of things but you know we're now three months on since my discussion with uh, with eric um so professor florian can you Give us a sense of where we are now, as I said, three months on with regards to vaccinations, antibody testing, which is something that you're obviously very passionate about. In the context of it's actually been a fairly busy three months in the world of vaccinations. I mean, and certainly the, the government here in the UK is is uh, is uh, incredibly proud of the number of first doses that they've given to uh, north of 15 million people. But uh, just from your perspective, an overall kind of big picture view on where we are with, with things at the moment. Um, first of all, thanks for inviting me, uh, Kevin. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, a lot of things happened in the last few months. Um, uh, several countries started to aggressively roll out vaccines. Of course, in my, in my uh, point of view, it could be even more aggressive in the US and the UK, but we see uh, very high vaccination rates already in Israel, for example, uh, and this continues. Um, of course, there are still uh, issues with getting enough vaccine supply and with actually getting people vaccinated. Um, but uh, the vaccination rates are going up every day. And so this is a very, very positive um, uh, development. And we, of course, see first uh, real life consequences of that. Uh, recent reports from Israel, uh, but also from the UK, show that uh, the vaccines, um, even in the, when, when they used in the population outside of a clinical trial, work very well. And I think this is a very good sign. What we also see is globally right now, the cases of SARS-CoV-2 infections are going down. It's not completely clear uh, why, this, uh, why this is happening. And it's not the same scenario and same situation in, in each and every country. But this is also a good sign. Um, but of course, uh, you've all heard about these variants that uh, started to emerge um, and uh, they make life a little bit more complicated because they seem to be a little bit more infectious than the garden variety SARS coronavirus 2. And some of them um, might actually reduce uh, vaccine uh, effectiveness. Uh, that doesn't mean that the vaccines don't work, but uh, in some cases, the vaccines might not work as well as they work against garden variety SARS coronavirus 2. Thank you. Um, can you just talk us through? what you actually do and your kind of work around antibody testing which is um kind of what eric and i spoke about back in december because it is um certainly from his perspective and i believe from your perspective a, a, a vital component of getting the travel industry moving again in a safe way yes of course um so we were one of the first labs globally that developed uh tests to to find out if, if people already had immunity to SARS coronavirus 2. Um, and we're very interested in uh, figuring out what actually protects people from infection, right? And so um, our studies, but uh, also a number of large studies that came out in the, in the last few uh, weeks and months suggest that if you had already a SARS coronavirus 2 infection and you make antibodies, you're zero positive, uh, your risk of getting another infection is very, very small. And I'm saying that this, although I know that there are media reports about reinfections, uh, but these reinfections are very rare. Um, several studies have now shown that um, having antibodies to SARS coronavirus 2 from a previous infection uh, can actually protect you better from, from uh, getting infected than uh, vaccination. And so um, we're getting pretty good data that suggests if people have antibodies, uh, they have a, a, a very, very low risk of getting infected again. Is there any data yet or research that you're aware of 
that speaks to how long antibodies are protecting people for? Or is it too early to say? Well, it's always too early to tell if you want to talk <laughs> about years and, you know, after five years, we'll probably want another five years of data. Um, but it doesn't seem like this immunity just goes away after a few weeks. So um, these antibody levels uh, usually go up very high after infection. Then they come down a little bit and then they usually stabilize. That's how the immune system works. And so we see uh, almost after a year now that people still have plenty of antibodies. And so um, I would not expect that the protection uh, is, is uh, disappearing within a year. Um, of course, the longer you wait, uh, the more likely it becomes that somebody has a reinfection, but even then the reinfection is probably mild or asymptomatic. Um, but I'm more talking about many years and not months. Um, and forgive my lack of knowledge about vaccines and antibodies here, I, I'm, I'm sure you will, but is there any difference at all between the antibodies that people get from a vaccination to the antibodies that they get from actually having the virus or is it exactly the same thing? No, it's different. So um, if you get infected, you make antibodies, but the level, so how much antibody you make uh, may be very different from one person to another. What we see with the vaccines is that if you get two shots, for example, of the RNA vaccines, everybody makes very high titers of antibodies. And so that's also why it's recommended that people who already had an infection still get vaccinated uh, just to get these very high, very homogeneous antibody titers. But the mechanism is the same. So these antibodies, these are small proteins that circulate in our bloodstream, uh, they bind to the virus and they prevent that the virus then can bind to our cells and infect us. And that's the mechanism. So if you have them, that's very good. And if you have more of them, uh, that's even better. So let's start connecting all this to what we do, which is right about the travel industry. And as you would have heard in the, in the previous sessions, getting the travel industry moving again, some form of recovery in a safer and seamless way. I mean, what, what what do you think? And this goes to the title of the session. I mean, what do you what do you think are the, some of the core elements that need to be put in place to make travel safe again? We've heard some different examples so far, but from your as a as a, as, a, as a man of medicine, what is what is your perspective? Well, uh, of course, uh, first of all, testing for virus is one uh, for active uh, infections is one uh, one of the aspects here, right? So um, if you board a plane and you know that everybody on the plane has been tested for the virus and everybody who is on the plane is negative, this, this that gives you a very, very good feeling about it. Um, and I think uh, testing for, for viral replication or for, for infection uh, is a, a big component. And uh, some airlines, for example, do that in some countries, in other places, that's not so common. Um, and then there's the question about uh, immunity, right? Uh, if you have a population of people who have antibodies, who have been vaccinated, who had an infection at some point, um, it's very hard for the virus to spread within that community. So if you take the cruise ship example for uh, that, that, that uh, we had in, 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 uh, in the beginning of last year, um, if nobody has immunity on a cruise ship, that death rates are very high, meaning a lot of people get infected if the virus uh, is on, on board of that ship. Uh, now, if everybody on that ship will have immunity, even if somebody gets an asymptomatic infection and comes on board, the virus would have a very hard time to spread and very likely nobody would get sick. So you would create a very, very um, safe environment and a very uh, an environment of very low risk uh, for people on that cruise ship if everybody would be vaccinated or would have antibodies. And so I think there's many examples where you could uh, implement either uh, nucleic acid testing, so basically testing for infectious virus, or uh, looking at immunity and then um, basically create spaces that are, are really safe. Just talk to us briefly, if you can, Florian, about the differencing, the differences, I beg your pardon, in types of tests, because some are deemed to be more effective than others. There is, you know, there is one that comes back incredibly quickly, but it may not be as accurate. So that's in, in a world of travel, which is very much about the speed of boarding and all those kind of things and rushing people through airports and all that kind of stuff. There's a bit of a dilemma there, isn't there? 
Yeah, yeah, that's true. And uh, in general, the quicker it comes back, the less reliable it is, right? right. Um, but antigen tests have been proven to to be a relatively good indication for uh, for if somebody is infectious or not. And those are these quick tests uh, that you can do with in uh, a few minutes, basically. So you take a nasal swab, um, and that can be done with a quick test, and uh, you, you just look for viral antigen. Um, and usually the, those correlate very well with, with infectious virus being present, right? So somebody might still have a little bit of virus, but not enough to actually culture the virus or infect somebody else. So um, I think these quick tests do have a place and it's uh, much better to use them than not to test at all. But of course, um, nucleic acid-based tests like PCR um, for, for uh, detecting virus are, are much more sensitive, uh, but they take time. And usually you get the results of the 24, 48 hours. And of course, that's very impractical. Um, Please go ahead. For the antibody tests, it's very similar. Usually uh, you need a blood sample for that. Uh, you need a serum sample. Uh, that doesn't have to be a, a regular blood draw. It can be a finger prick. Um, but again, it takes some time until you get those results if you do it with a proper test. Uh, there are also quick tests where you can uh, figure out very, very uh, rapidly if somebody has antibodies or not, but those are usually also less reliable. So going back to the, 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 the comment I made at the beginning of the question, you, you know, these are scenarios based on testing that require whether it happens when people arrive at the airport and they check in or in the example of a cruise ship when they're at the at the at the port or if you want a more reliable one you do it 24 hours before that completely messes with as i said you know the procedures that we go through as travelers whether it's checking in or whatever i mean how does a a, a cruise ship or an airline or an airport or a, um, you know homeland security or in, in the us or whoever is responsible for it how do they kind of if you have some thoughts on how do they manage that given we want reliability but we also don't want hundreds of passengers turning up for a flight on a massive a380 uh, aircraft and all crammed in somewhere getting tested well it, it kind of depends uh, if it's now testing for active virus or if it's testing for immunity um yeah. because testing for virus is something that needs to happen relatively close to uh, travel for example, because um, if I'm negative three weeks, if I was negative three weeks ago, I can be positive today, right? So you want a, a smaller window, but you could, for example, communicate that people have to uh, get a test uh, within 72 hours of traveling. And when they come to the airport, they have to show that they are PCR negative, and then you allow them uh, to, to board the plane, right? And this is has actually been done by, I, I know personally, for example, that uh, KLM used to do that in, in Europe for some time. Um, but um, with the antibody test, it's a little bit easier because A, you could provide a certificate that you're vaccinated. And if you get vaccinated in the US, you get these little cards from the CDC that actually indicate when you were vaccinated. Um, or if you do an antibody test, the antibodies don't go away and you could do that test now and then travel in five months and you would probably still be able to travel with that test. So uh, I think these are different scenarios uh, for uh, for looking for uh, infectious virus. You need to do the test right before you travel. Um, if you're looking for immunity, you can basically do the test whenever uh, it's possible and then travel much later, right? Okay, so we've talked um, we've talked about the transportation part of all this, but you know a large swathe of the industry is also where you actually sleep at night. So it's a different scenario. You mentioned scenarios just then. It's a different scenario when we talk about hotels and private accommodation and things like that. I mean, how do you how do you think that the providers of those should be tackling this issue in the same way that airports, airlines and cruise lines, for example, are thinking about tackling this? I mean, you could actually tackle it in the same way and create a safe space in a certain hotel where, you know, everybody who checks in actually has immunity, for example, right? Uh, that's one possibility. Uh, you could also um, 
take a halfway solution and, and make sure that uh, all your hotel stuff is vaccinated um, and that at least um, makes make sure that they don't transmit virus among inst- each other and uh, to the guests and that they don't get infected by the guests, right? So I think that that would be an interesting step. In terms of, uh, of um, Replic- of, of infectious virus, it's much harder, right, in a hotel setting. You might have a lot of people. It's a more dynamic situation. People are coming in all the time. Uh, they, I mean, in a resort, people might stay in that resort, so that's easier to manage. But if you think about the hotel in a, in a, in a city, um, people leave and they go shopping and they go sightseeing and then they come back. So they have many interactions, right? And it's really hard to keep that under control with uh, with uh, this infectious virus, um, but again, if you if you're running a, a resort hotel somewhere where people in general stay in that uh, in that hotel, um, um, it's it's easier to manage because you arrive there with a negative test. You might actually take another test on the day of arrival, and then uh, you should be okay, uh, and everybody should be safe. Um, but again, it depends on the situation. Another area of the industry that we talk a lot about is the stuff that people do. So tours, activities, the very reason often, unless you're a business traveler, the very reason why you travel. So it's the experiences that you do. Is it fair to say that they are really at the the extreme end of this because it's something that um, travelers might do or tourists might do just for an hour, go and visit a museum? I mean, how do those types of organizations and providers of experiences do this. I mean, you're having a holding pen for people to be tested or provide this is not something that ordinary, you know, people often have to queue up for ages for a museum anyway, let alone having to do all these kind of things. So how how does that kind of get managed, do you think? I think it's almost impossible to implement testing there. If you think about a museum, uh, I think the only thing that can be done is to make sure that there is enough space between people, uh, that uh, there is enough airflow in this uh, in these uh, facilities, and that yeah. people are wearing masks. Um, I think that's the only thing you can do. But there are other activities that might be outside, and I'm thinking about all kinds of sports activities. Um, that are very, very safe just because they are outside. Um, and that's in general a rule. As long as you are outside, uh, the chances that uh, you get infected are much lower because there's so much air movement uh, that you don't get easily exposed to, to that much virus. All inside activities are potentially uh, much more dangerous. Uh, but again, many of these things might be manageable with uh, leaving enough space, having enough airflow and uh, enforcing wearing masks. And um, we're coming up towards our end of our time here, Florian. I mean, you've you heard me discussing with uh, Gloria from WTTC about coordination between governments and the industry. Um, what's your kind of perspective, if 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 any, around the work that you do and how that's coordinated with would be the CDC in the US and EU bodies and things like that? Is it do you? Do you have an opinion on whether you think that's happening efficiently and effectively at the moment? Well, the efficiently and effectively, that's that's a question. But of course, um, policymakers and the CDC uh, and uh, also European uh, um, regulators, they look at the data that's out there and they make decisions based on that data. And if enough data accumulates, uh, they change uh, policy, right? Um, there are in, in several countries policies in place that uh, you know restrict people who already had infections less than people who never had a SARS-CoV-2 infection, just because the risk is lower that uh, these people carry the virus uh, and uh, spread it, right? So uh, I think policy making is always a little bit slower than uh, the science that informs it, um, but I think we'll see. Uh, changes in the in the next few months, also based on vaccine rollout and so on and so forth. And I think Israel is always a place to look at and to see what they are doing because they are far ahead of the curve um, and they might start to implement changes that uh, then a few months later might also apply to the UK or the, to the US or, or, or the European Union. Uh, apologies, I'm 
massively overexposed here because it's unusually sunny here for February in the UK. So apologies for that. But uh, uh, I said this to your colleague Eric in December, and I don't say this to very many people in the industry. I, you know, to, just to thank you for all the work that you do and uh, best of luck for everything else that materializes for you over the rest of this year. And uh, thanks ever so much, Professor Florian Kramer from Mount Sinai Medical Center for joining us on uh, Focus Wire Pulse Day. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.